morning and welcome to Christ Community Church Online. We're so glad that you have joined us this morning and that you're here worshiping with us. Uh, we want you to do something for us really quick. We want you to share this live stream with your friends and your family. You can click the share button and share to your page, or you can just invite someone, tag them in the comments below. Um, we have found out that there are some people um, joining us every Sunday morning from all over, from Pennsylvania to Ohio to Germany to Africa. And so we're so excited that you all are joining us. And what we want you to do is we want you in the comments below to tell us where you're tuning in from, where you're joining us this morning for worship. We would really appreciate that. Um, I'm, shortly, I'm going to put three different links in our comments, and those links are really important this morning so we can get you connected to our church. The first one is if you are a first-time guest to our live stream, we're so glad that you're here with us, and we want to connect with you. So if you could fill that out for us, we'll contact you dur uh, during the week and get to know you a little bit better. Also, our prayer request, uh, we pray every single week for these requests, and we want to know what's going on in your life, how you're doing, and how we can best pray for you throughout the week. So please make sure you fill that out this morning. And last is our online small groups. Uh, we want you to stay connected, especially during this time. So we hope that you fill that out, get connected into a small group and into our church family. Again, wherever you're tuning in from this morning, we're glad that you're here with us, and we're going to continue with worship. During these unusual and uncertain times, it is important that we remember that God is still working. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, For I am confident in this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. This is the hope that we can rest in, that even though we may not see it or feel it at times, God is still working in the world around us, and he's still working within us, using these very circumstances to shape us into the image of his son. Whatever God begins, he finishes, he made us his promise, and he won't stop now.
is working all things for good, even in times of waiting. And right now, we're doing a lot of waiting, aren't we? We're waiting to spend time with friends and loved ones. We're waiting for businesses to open. We're waiting for circumstances to change. But we don't have to wait passively. We have a weapon that we can access right now, that you can access from the comfort of your home today. And that weapon is praise. Praising God in the waiting, in the seasons of uncertainty, silences the enemy and deflates the fear that threatens our hope and faith. Praise and worship renews our confidence in the Lord. It takes the focus of our, off of ourselves and our circumstances and back onto our mighty God who equips us with the tools that we need to persevere in the middle of the storm. When we raise a hallelujah, we proclaim his power over our circumstances and heaven comes to fight for us.
34, verse 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Now, David wrote these words during a desperate and difficult season in his life, and yet he could still say that God is good. And in this verse, he is urging us to taste and see the goodness of God for ourselves. David invites us to draw close to God, to trust him, to take refuge in him like he did, so that we too can experience all the goodness that God has to offer. Love, protection, direction, joy, peace, forgiveness, and so much more. God's goodness and provision are never affected by world events. In good times and bad, we can expect every day to be surrounded by his goodness. And sometimes, when we lean on God in tough situations, that's when we truly taste and see his goodness and faithfulness the most. love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will say of the goodness of God. In all my life you have been faithful. In all my life you have been so, so the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and in darkest night. You are close like no
Good morning. I'm Daryl Reimer, Administrative Pastor here at Christ Community Church. As we prepare our hearts for prayer, I'd like to share a story about a remarkable man named David Ring. To say his life was enormously difficult would be an understatement. You see, David Ring was born dead, and he was left in the delivery room unattended, without oxygen, for another 18 minutes. Somehow, by God's grace, he was revived, but the oxygen deficiency resulted in cerebral palsy. To make matters worse, David's childhood years were littered with tragedy. His brothers died of hemophilia. His parents divorced. His father died of cancer when he was 11. At age 14, his mother, the only person he believed that could love him, also died of cancer. His family wanted to institutionalize him. He dropped out of school. He became deeply depressed and attempted suicide several times, but was unsuccessful. He was angry and self-pitying. He hated God, and most of all, he hated himself. But God wanted to partner with David Ring to do the impossible. Wanting death, he was introduced to life through Jesus Christ. He made the choice to accept a new beginning he returned to high school and then earned his college degree from William Jewell College in Liberty, Missouri. He learned to accept himself and believe that in spite of his physical limitations, he was still fearfully and wonderfully made. So in 1973, with a pronounced limp and a difficult speech impediment, David courageously started giving his testimony wherever and whenever given the opportunity. God has since used him to speak over 250 times a year, touching thousands with his signature message that he begins, I have cerebral palsy. I serve the Lord with all that is within me. What's your problem? Today, David is blessed with a loving wife, four healthy children, and a talented evangelistic staff. When asked about the secret to his success, David Ring said this, don't ask why. Ask what? What do you want me to do with my problems, God? How can I glorify you with them? The same message God gave the Apostle Paul rang true for David Ring. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. During this coronavirus pandemic, the sheer worldwide scope and deadly random spread has made us all realize just how weak we really are. Many are asking, why God, why? Instead, what a tremendous time then for each of us to ask him, what? What would you have me to do in such a time as this? I can almost imagine God saying, perfect. Now I can partner with each of you in your life, in your neighborhood, in your city, and in your state to glorify my name and bring heaven to earth through Jesus Christ, my son. And like the song we just sang, we too then can join the chorus, raise a hallelujah. Let us pray. Dear God, we just thank you so much for giving us this time all throughout the community and even around the world, an opportunity to join together in seeking your face, God, and worshiping you. God, we thank you that in the midst of this such a different time than any of us have ever experienced, God, you are working mightily. And God, you've always desired for our hearts to be turned towards you. But now that we, as we feel helpless, we realize how much we do need you. So God, we pray that as your word goes out, that many today and in the days ahead will realize I need that Jesus that they're talking about. And God, we pray that you will show us where there is sin in our lives and how we need to repent and be saved. Lord, we thank you that so many of us have been blessed during this time, but there's others that are really, really hurting and struggling. And so during this time, we have an opportunity 
to do things like the nurses and doctors did in Cartersville, Georgia. After they finished their shift, they went and stood on the top of the hospital and sang Waymaker. God, there's all kinds of opportunities now to touch the world for you. Oh, help us not to miss these opportunities. Lord, help us to realize that as we're obedient to you, you're going to take care of all the rest. You're going to watch over us. And Lord, there'll be so many more in heaven to be able to rejoice with after this is all over. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. Bless our pastor as he brings this tremendous message to us today. Lord, help us to learn from your word and be able to respond and do exactly as you're speaking to our hearts about. We pray it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. I'm glad you're here. I really wish you were here instead of just being here. Uh, I'm George Gasperson. I'm the pastor here at Christ Community Church. Hey, I want to say a quick thank you really quickly to a bunch of our church family members who gave Margaret and I the surprise of our life yesterday afternoon. We were sitting outside uh, in lawn chairs, looked up, and here comes a long stream of cars, uh, completely a surprise to us, but they were families of our church who just drove by. They had uh, posters and signs written up. They gave us rolls of toilet paper, and they gave us uh, uh, paper towels, all kinds of stuff. But most of all, they just, it was, it, we got to see them and tell them that we loved them, and they told us, they loved us as well. It was a gift that is unimaginable, and we just want to say thank you to all uh, who took part in that. It's been five weeks since we've been doing church like this, and if you're like me, you're just about tired of this entire thing. Now, I'm not trying to make light of a, of a serious situation, and I want you to know that I respect what's happening but I'm sensing within me, and maybe you are within you as well, a frustration, a growing frustration that our lives and our livelihoods are being held hostage by something that is completely out of our control. Well, this morning, let's turn the corner on some of this. Let's refocus our attention. Instead of being constantly consumed with what's out there, the, the things that we can't control, let's get back to the business of spiritual growth. For our friends who have just only recently found us through our weekly live stream, let me catch you up on where our church family has been headed since the first of the year. At the start of 2020, our church began a spiritual journey together, and our goal is to become real disciples of Jesus. So what do you say we get back on task? We get back to what we were doing before. And I invite all of you, whether you are uh, members of uh, our church family or virtual members of our church family through our live stream. I invite all of you to come and let's for the next few weeks journey together. Today we're going to begin a new sermon series on the Old Testament book of Joshua. And the theme of the book of Joshua is conquest. It's about stepping out in faith and acting on the promises of God. And so if you have a Bible around or you want to use the Bible app on your phone and you want to find Joshua uh, in your Bible, it's the, the sixth book of the, of the Bible, let me give you some background why you're turning to Joshua chapter 1. Exactly who was Joshua? Joshua was Moses second in command as the Israelites wandered in the desert and when Moses died, Joshua became the Israelite leader. Joshua was, was the logical 
replacement for Moses. Not only because he was Moses' assistant, but because more importantly, Joshua had personally encountered God for himself. Think about this. Joshua was born while the Israelites were still in slavery in Egypt. Joshua witnessed the Passover. He walked out of Egypt along with all of the other Israelites. He was there to see the hand of God destroy the Egyptian army at the Red Sea. Joshua followed the pillar of fire by day and the cloud by night. He was with Moses at Mount Sinai when God gave the Ten Commandments. Joshua was also one of the 12 spies sent into the Promised Land, and he and Caleb were the only ones with enough faith to believe that the Israelites could defeat the inhabitants of the land. See, Joshua didn't just follow Moses. Joshua followed God. So the book of Joshua begins where the previous book of Deuteronomy ends. The nation of Israel was poised on the east bank of the Jordan River, and they were ready to cross over and take possession of the promised land that God had given them. And so the title of today's message is When God Pushes You Forward. And I want us to talk about and go through this morning together some of those times when God prompts us in our lives, kind of pushes us along to step out and take a step of faith. In Joshua 1, which we're uh, ready to read in just a moment, God pushes Joshua toward a whole new place in his faith. And I want us to use Joshua's story this morning to help us know what to do when we're sensing that God could be pushing us forward. So let's read this passage together. And we'll take a closer look. We're going to be reading from Joshua chapter 1, and our story is, is found in the first nine verses. So Joshua chapter 1, here's what the Bible says. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, You and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west." No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous, God said to Joshua. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Imagine how Joshua must have felt when God showed up. I can imagine him sitting at the breakfast table, reading the paper, 
when God taps him on the shoulder and pushes him into a completely new territory in faith. I wonder how you would have reacted. Hey, take a minute, and in the comment box down at the bottom of your screen, let me know with a little comment what you would, how you would have reacted if you were Joshua, and all of a sudden God shows up to say something like this. When God wants to push us forward into new spiritual territory, his goal is not to show up and then scare us to death and then give us an impossible task and then mysteriously disappear. God always has a plan and he always has a method. And this method that God uses to push us into new territory always comes with three different elements. So let me share them with you this morning. Here's the first element of God's process. It is called God's task for us. Verses 2 and 3 highlight this. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. And this is the task. This is what God wanted Joshua to accomplish, to assume leadership of the people, to ready himself, to ready the people, and then lead them across the Jordan and conquer the land that has been promised to them. Now, I looked through the Bible as I thought about how God pushes us and how God presents a task to us. I looked at other people's story in the Bible, who God moved forward in faith like this, and I noticed a similarity. The similarity is when God gives somebody a task, it is always made clear and easy to understand. Remember Mary, Jesus' mother? Here's the task God gave her. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. As impossible as that might sound, it's hard to be confused. God was clear. How about Abraham's call? Leave your country, God said, Abraham, your people and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. A clear and easy to understand call. And even Moses had a clear call. God said, I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing the Israelites. So now go, God said, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And when God wants to push you gently forward in faith, his task will be unmistakable for you as well. You'll know it deep down inside. But here's the thing. Hearing and understanding what God is saying to us is not really our problem. Our problem is that we don't want to believe what God is asking us to do. So here's what happens. We either pretend we didn't hear him or we start to make up excuses about why we can't do what God is asking us to do. Mary gave excuses to God. Read it. Moses, that will crack you up. He he gave about 10 or 20 excuses why he couldn't lead the Israelites out of Egypt. I got to tell you, I belong to this club as well, because when God wanted to move me into pastoral ministry, I coughed up a bunch of excuses about why I couldn't become a minister myself. But the bottom line is this, when God wants to push you into new spiritual territory, you'll hear and you'll understand that God wants to move you forward. So that's, that's the first element of God's process of moving us into new territory. He gives us a task, which brings us to the second element. 
his reassurance. This comes to Joshua in verse 5. God said, no one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. The task that God was giving Joshua wasn't just monumental. It was exponentially monumental. See, first Joshua had to take over for perhaps the greatest man of faith that had ever lived. Think back about what Moses had accomplished, confronting Pharaoh, leading the Israelites to freedom, parting the Red Sea, receiving the law from God on Mount Sinai. Those are some pretty big shoes to fill. And then there was the future. It would be up to Joshua to lead an entire nation of people into a land inhabited by hostile residents. There would be battles. There would no doubt be complaining from his own people. There would be these constant voices in his head telling him that he was ill-prepared, that he was a poor leader, that he was a failure. But God knew all this. And he didn't send Joshua out without reassurance. In fact, God gave Joshua one of the greatest promises in the entire Bible. And this is just simply more proof that we serve a good and loving God. See, when he nudges people, us included, into uncharted territories of faith, He reassures everyone that everything will be all right. And when you sense God moving you forward, you'll hear more than just marching orders. There's more to this than just go accomplish this task for me. You'll hear your loving Heavenly Father promise that He will never leave you to do this alone. So when God wants to push us forward into new spiritual territory, he begins with a clearly understood and articulated task. And then he accomplishes, he accompanies that task with the reassurance that he's going to go with us and that he will help us. And that brings us to the third element of God's process, uh, of God's method, and that is the process. See, God doesn't give marching orders and then ask us to figure out how to get it done. God has the process already mapped out. And God's process for Joshua came in three steps. Step one, God says this, I'm giving you a plan, now follow it. Verses three and four, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the great sea on the west. Here's something about God. God doesn't make spur-of-the-moment decisions, and he doesn't make hasty plans. God has already been to all of the places that he wants you to go. And he's already been there preparing the way for you. Just because we might now be only, just because we might only now be finding out about God's plan doesn't mean it's a new plan. It means that God is only now ready to involve us in what he's doing. Even though the Israelites were still on this side of the Jordan, even though the promised land was yet to be settled, God had planned for this moment years earlier. He defined the promised land boundaries years earlier for Moses. And as we'll see in the coming weeks, God has a step-by-step plan to drive out the inhabitants of the land. Joshua and the Israelites didn't have to figure anything out. They just had to follow the plan. 
And my friends, the same will be true for us. And this is a lesson I personally had to learn the hard way. When God redirected my life and called me into the ministry, I heard what he said to me. I understood the task at hand. And I'm happy to say that I heard the reassurance that God gave me that everything would be all right, that he would help me as I journeyed along this new path. But I made the mistake of following my own plan instead of God's plan. See, I thought to myself that when God called me into ministry, he wanted me to begin to be a pastor tomorrow. And so I began to take matters into my own hands, and I made things a whole lot worse. God was saying, slow down, son. You need to learn some things before you begin to be a pastor. When God moves us forward, we don't have to figure out how to make it happen. God makes the plan, and we follow the plan. That's step one. Step two, God says this, I'm giving you guiding principles. Now, obey them. Verses 7 and 8, God said to Joshua, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to observe all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn to it from the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Don't let the book of law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. God is talking about a law. And the law that God is referring to is the law that he gave Moses on Mount Sinai. Now, you might recognize this as the Ten Commandments, and that's when God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments. But along with this came a vast array of principles and commandments that governed all the lives of the Israelite people. And keeping this law enabled the Israelites to be God's people, and it allowed God to be their God. You might not have read through all the law in the Old Testament that God gave the Israelites. I have. And I kind of looked back and kind of familiarized myself with it as well. And I got to tell you that there's nothing in this law about crossing rivers or about assaulting walled cities. And I got to thinking, why under these circumstances of getting ready to cross the Jordan River, why is God wanting to talk about the law? And here's the answer. God was reminding Joshua that no task, no journey, no conquest would ever be more important than obedience to his word or purity of his heart. See, in God's eyes, who you are will always be more important than what you do. God wasn't looking for a great soldier or a master battle planner in Joshua. Physical talents, great personalities, those have never been God's yardstick for greatness. Those have been man's standards. God's qualifications for service are inner qualities like humility and teachability and piety. So here's a principle that every one of us needs to copy down and underline and live by. The principle goes like this. In life, you will only go as far as your character and integrity can take you. And the same holds true in God's kingdom as well. That's why God said, never let the law depart from your lips or your minds or your heart.
And then the third step to God's process, God says this, I'm giving you promises, now you hold on to them. Two verses, verse 6 and verse 9, contain tremendous promises from God. Let's look at those verses one at a time. First, verse 6. God says, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. I wonder if you noticed this phrase. Notice the phrase, you will lead them. God is telling Joshua that success has already been predetermined. See, when God pushes Joshua forward in his faith, he was not saying something like this. Hey, Joshua, you know, I just had a thought. See that river over there? Why don't you wade out in there and see how far you get? I mean, just just give it a try and see what happens. That's not at all what God was saying. God was saying, Joshua, I know what I'm asking you to do looks tough. It looks intimidating. But I've had this planned all along. I've worked everything out. And I'm promising you right here and right now that there is no question about your success. And so with my help, you can do this. Just remember, when God pushes you gently forward for a step of faith, he's already gone before you. He's already prepared the way, and your success has already been established. And there's a second promise in verse 9. Verse 9 says this, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever ever you go. And the phrase I want you to focus on in that verse is the phrase, do not be discouraged. I don't think God would have used that phrase if there weren't going to be some circumstances that are going to come up where discouragement would be a possibility. See, when God pushes us forward, into new areas of faith, you can bet that fear is going to show up sooner or later. And fear has some friends. Their names are doubt, despair, and discouragement. Think about it. Joshua was now in charge of a gazillion people. He had to organize them. He had to motivate them. He had to encourage them. He had to prepare them. There was this fast-flowing river to cross. There were walled cities that contained armies larger and stronger than Joshua's. And you can bet that there was also this steady drip, drip, drip of criticism and backbiting from his own people, and it was a perfect recipe for discouragement. But listen to what God says. Joshua, don't believe what your eyes might see. Don't believe what your ears might be hearing. And above all, Don't believe these emotional voices in your head that tells you that it's hopeless, that you're not, it's not going to work, and that God isn't here. God makes Joshua a promise. Don't be discouraged because I will always be there. Maybe you're dealing with a little bit of discouragement this morning. Maybe you need to hear God say to you, listen, don't trust your eyes. Don't trust your ears. Don't listen to your emotions. I'm right here. 
And God said, I will never, ever, ever, ever leave you. So we're on a journey together. Our church family and you're included. We're in the process of becoming real disciples, real followers of Jesus, not fakes, not pretenders, not fans, but real followers. And if you're seriously trying your best to follow God, then it won't be long until you sense that God is giving you a task and pushing you forward in a new step of faith. So let me just kind of bring all this to a close by helping you discern if maybe this is what God might be asking you to do this morning. As I think about it, I can think of four common life events that God kind of typically uses as a backdrop to push us forward in a step of faith. Let me share those four with you. The first life event is when there's a new normal in our lives. For Joshua, a new normal in life came with the death of Moses. Moses had been the leader for 40 years. He was the unquestioned leader, and boy, what a leader he was. But in verse 2, God said, Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you. And so what could a new normal look like in our lives? Well, maybe the passing of a loved one or the loss of a job, or the onset of a chronic disease, or anything else that signals permanent change. Sometimes God uses these circumstances as a means of pushing us forward in a step of faith. A second is when there's a new season in life, a new addition to your family, a new job, a relocation, going off to school, Those begin new seasons in life, and they're common times for God to move us forward in our faith. The third time is when you feel restlessness in your spirit. Do you know what the precursor of change is? It's dissatisfaction. And I've seen God move a person many times by putting in their hearts and in their spirits a sense of restlessness, as if nothing is really satisfying, as if you, you ask yourself, Isn't, shouldn't there be more to life? This might be God creating circumstances in a time that he wants to push you forward in a step of faith. And the fourth time is when you become spiritually aware. Now, many of you who have connected with us kind of just recently through live streaming are kind of new to this experience of personal faith. Maybe church just hasn't been a part of your life recently, and faith hasn't been on your radar until this virus stuff started, and somehow you found us. And for whatever reason, you've continued to watch a time or two or three. And it kind of feels like it's starting to work for you. And it's beginning to make a little bit of sense in your life. You know what's happening? You're becoming spiritually aware. You're sensing that there's a spiritual part of you that needs just as much attention as your physical body does. Listen, the more you pay attention to this new dynamic in your life, the more you'll sense that it's God drawing you closer and closer 
to him. And that's God pushing you forward in your faith. God has for you a meaningful part to play in the kingdom of God. But in order to take your place and to live into that purpose and that role in God's kingdom, you've got to move forward in your faith. You've got to conquer new territory, spiritually speaking. And although God has planned this future for you and has assured you that he will be with you, the challenges of stepping out in faith must be faced. They must be fought. And these areas of faith must be conquered. And unless God gently pushes us along, we'll likely never go on our own. And so let me ask you, could God be gently pushing you forward in a step of faith? Your step of faith, your new territory that God wants to introduce you to this morning will likely look very different from somebody else's because you have your own life and you have your own unique circumstances. But there is always a step further place for those who follow Jesus. And I just wonder if it might not be time to make the decision to say yes to God, to take a step forward in our faith and begin the greatest journey of your life. Let me pray with you, please. My Father, this morning, uh, your word has come to us in the form of a challenge. Through the life of Joshua, you have showed us that following you means that you show up with a task, you show up with reassurance, and you show up with a plan. But it's a step forward. And God, as we, as we hear this and as we understand it, and maybe as we contextualize it in our own lives, we begin to get a little afraid. We begin to try to think up an excuse or two why we just can't do this right now. Father, I pray for a supreme amount of godly courage where we can follow in Joshua's footsteps and just simply say, yes, Lord, if that's where you want me to go, if you promise to be with me, if you take care of fear, and if you never leave me, I'll take that step that you asked me to take. God, let that be our prayer this week. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let me thank you again for joining us in our live stream. Could I ask you a favor before you leave? Each week from here on out until we get through with this sermon series, we're going to walk step by step, chapter by chapter through this book of Joshua. And there are some critical lessons of faith and of life that we can learn together. I'm going to ask you to join me and us every week at this time. Let's do this together. Set this aside as a priority in your life. And maybe for the first time ever, let's journey in faith together and see where God wants to take us. Please remember how much your pastoral staff loves you. We're available to you. Let us know how we can help you. Um, We miss you desperately, and we long for the day, and it's coming, that we're all going to be together again. God bless you. Have a great week, and I'll see you here again next week.